Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic, which is going to break down the earnings call from January 24th, 2024, which covered Q4 and fiscal 2023. Let's start off by saying this call was not well received by investors, judging from the mass exodus in the after hours trading on Wednesday. And honestly, from what we could gather, there's not a whole lot to be particularly happy about. Tesla missed on three key metrics. Earnings per share were short of estimates, profits were down, and sales were pretty much stagnant. Certainly nowhere near the 50% year-over-year growth that previous investors have bought in on. Going through the investor slides ahead of the call at 5.30 p.m., there were a couple of things that jumped off the sheets right away. Given our past coverage of the Solar City acquisition, we're always curious how that division is performing. Since at the time Musk sold Solar City to Tesla, according to the court documents, they were forecasting installations would be in the neighborhood of 523 to 710 megawatts per quarter. That was what Tesla shareholders were told to expect in 2018 after taking over Solar City. A necessary step, Musk told them, when trying to convince them that Tesla was a sustainable energy company instead of a car company. But the solar division that Tesla shareholders paid $2.6 billion to acquire, on top of the debt load they assumed, only managed to attract 41 megawatts worth of business and was down 59% year over year. This is all that remains of the only sustainable energy component of the Tesla portfolio. Everything else that Tesla makes and sells requires energy and generates nothing. One of the other numbers that jumped off the page was this line, where Tesla has an income tax related entry for almost $6 billion, which had people on Twitter chattering as to what they thought it might be. So ears definitely perked up when this part was covered in the call. Other items we picked up on included the failure to mention Dojo at all. There's no mention of Semi either, except to say it's still in pilot production, right above the only mention of Roadster 2, which still doesn't know where it might be built and says is in development, as it has been since 2017. Promised an electric car by this year. I put a deposit down. Where's my goddamn electric car, Bruce? You can go over the entire document at your leisure. It's available on their website, downloadable as a PDF. The call was over an hour long, so we have to cut it down as much as possible. And we've also, once again, taken the Mumble King's speech pattern and turned it into something you can actually listen to. The audio-only broadcast was hosted by Martin Vieca, the Tesla VP of Investor Relations, whose job must have been quite interesting in recent weeks. Martin's name doesn't appear anywhere on the Tesla website, nor on the Investor Relations page. To see him and his position, you have to find him on LinkedIn. We'll skip over the introductions and get right into the items of note that we picked up on during the call. You're welcome to add any others you found interesting in the comment section. But we should probably start off with Martin's legal disclaimer. During this call, we will discuss our business outlook and make forward-looking statements. These comments are based on our predictions and expectations as of today. Then we're right into Musk's opening remarks, telling us how the Fremont factory is the highest output auto factory in North America, a point he made four times in the same breath. Then telling us Model Y became the best-selling auto model globally, without mentioning the decline in the sale of the Tesla Premium products, S and X. He says the Tesla Energy Storage Division created 15 gigawatt hours of storage, without mentioning the failing solar division. And towards the end of his opening comments, he makes this statement. If we execute on all these things, and it is very hard to do all these things, it's not a, not a sure thing, but I, I do see a path where Tesla could one day be the most valuable company in the world. I, I do emphasize that as but an easy path and a very difficult one is it's now in the set of possible outcomes. And previously, I would not have thought it is in the set of possible outcome. Musk says until recently, he didn't think that Tesla becoming the most valuable company in the world was in the set of possible outcomes, except he's been making that lofty claim on calls and in interviews since 2022. Before that, in 2020 and going back to 2017. And it probably came out of his mouth even before that. So unless 2017 is recently in his book, this is a very old pump and dump talking point going back years. Not at all a new development. Following Musk's opening comments, we heard from Vibe Haftanea, the new master of coin, sorry, chief financial officer at Tesla. There were a couple of points that he brought up, including the fact that the $36,000 cost of goods sold COGS on Tesla vehicles had been reduced to the point where they were approaching their natural limit meaning further reductions in price are going to be difficult to find. So when you see these further price reductions coming out to move vehicles, anything under $36,000 per Tesla is going to be eating into their profit. 
and the company doesn't sell enough premium products to account for a loss leader on their entry-level products. Vibe Have also brings up that $6 billion credit that we noticed during this segment, and it's the only time it's mentioned. Our 2023 cap net income was impacted by the recognition of one-time non-cash benefit of $5.9 billion from the release of valuation allowance on certain deficit tax assets. This was due to our recent history of sustained profitability. Accordingly, starting with Q1, our book tax rate will now be more in line with other companies in the S&P 500. So this is a one-time non-cash tax credit, which was put into the flow diagram at this point, which made profits appear much higher than they were for the quarter and therefore for the year. This chart also serves well as a learning tool for people who think that Tesla is a robotics or AI company. Try to find where income from those two aspects is located on this chart. If you can't do it, it's because Tesla makes the vast majority of its income from the sale of automobiles. Getting into the investors' questions, there's this one about the expansion in Nevada and the new Giga Mexico. When will Tesla start uh, construction on the Giga Nevada expansion and Giga Mexico? And when can we expect each of these to produce their first products, such as 4680 cells, semi, and the next gen vehicles? We have recently broken ground for the next phase of Giga Nevada uh, expansion to incorporate semi and other projects. But as said earlier, as regarding Mexico, we want to first demonstrate success with the next generation platform in Austin before we start construction. Therefore, we have started the long lead work to get the basics ready and plan to follow our recipe from the 3Y ramp with Shanghai, where we started with learnings from Fremont and ramped really quickly. Yeah, exactly. It's important to emphasize that, uh, I mean, Model 3 production was was three years of hell, honestly, before some of the really worst years of my life, frankly. Um, I've still have mental scar tissue from those three years, as do many. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and if you think those three years were hard on Musk, you should talk to the workers who actually contributed to fixing the problems. Be that as it may, there's a lot here to unpack. First, with the expansion of Giga Nevada. Tesla has, indeed, broken ground on an expansion plot in Nevada. However, the company that actually runs Giga Nevada, Panasonic, has some big reservations about their plans to build out further factories due to an EV adoption rate slowdown. And the 4680 cells are not coming together as expected. While Panasonic has broken ground on their second factory in Kansas, they also announced just last month that their candidate site in Oklahoma was no longer moving forward. And when it comes to the 4680 cell they planned on producing for Tesla, that production process has yet to be perfected. Nine different sources report that the dry coating process being used on the cathodes is presently turning the cells into a gooey mess. Now as for Giga Mexico, don't expect that to come online anytime soon. See, here's the checkmark list that Tesla says in this call they need to complete prior to constructing the Mexico factory. Obviously, they have to figure out what their next-gen vehicle is going to look like, inside and out. Then they have to determine what the assembly line will look like to build those vehicles. Then, of course, they have to build out the line, which they plan on doing in Austin, Texas, not in Mexico. After building it in Texas, they have to ramp it up. And with the Model 3 ramp, according to Musk, that process took three years to iron out the kinks. And then, Musk says, they'll look at constructing the Mexico factory. As Musk has a habit of saying far too often, this might happen by the end of next year, which is absolute nonsense. At the rate he's going, not even the next-gen vehicle will have taken form by then, and he started teasing those at the 2023 annual shareholder meeting while also stating these two next-gen vehicles would be produced at a rate of more than 5 million units per year. Musk also states, of course, that the manufacturing processes they're coming up with are going to be unlike anything the world has seen before. Quite reminiscent of when he announced the Model 3 production line was going to be fully automated, but of course that didn't happen, so it did indeed have to be manned by humans in a tent in the parking lot in California. Also reminiscent of how the giga casting process they came up with was revolutionary, except there are companies that make that equipment for them and sell it to other customers around the world, for better or worse, as many car manufacturers moved away from such casting processes after failure rates became unacceptable. GM, on the other hand, went the other way and bought a company called Tooling and Equipment International to advance their casting methods. The kicker here is that TEI was a key supplier to Tesla's giga casting process until GM closed the deal last November. And pretty sure Musk made similar claims about the advanced nature of the assembly line for Cybertruck, did he not? And that's apparently still not running, which brings us to the Cybertruck reservation claims. How many Cybertruck orders are in the queue and when do you anticipate to be able to fill existing orders? 
the reservation to order conversion rate so far has been very, very encouraging. If the trend continues, we will soon sort out all the bills in 2024. Yeah, it's important to emphasize that um, this is very much a production constrained situation, mm -hmm. not a demand constrained situation. We could dramatically raise the price, but that doesn't feel right to us to sort of get, get, you know, gouge people for early, early delivery. But, but really the demand is off the hook. Musk makes a claim here that he doesn't feel comfortable raising the price and gouging people for what he calls early delivery. Except the vehicles being delivered right now are long overdue and the prices have already shot through the roof. For as long as we, the price is affordable, I see us ultimately delivering on the order of a quarter million Cybertrucks a year uh, in, in North America. I mean, it's a, it's, it sure is a head turner. Definitely is. Yeah. Anywhere you go, people look at you. Yeah. They give you a thumbs up. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's like finally the, the future looks like the future. That's our, best, that's our best product ever. When it comes to the Cybertruck numbers, the amount of conflicting messages is crazy. Musk is constantly telling people there are 2 million reservations for this clown car without providing any receipts. Yet people have posted recent reservation screenshots stating they'll have expected delivery in 2024. During this call, it said that Tesla will have sold out all of the 2024 builds shortly. But assuming the 2 million reservation number isn't the bald-faced lie to make interest in the vehicle seem orders of magnitude higher than actual, people ordering one today should not expect their tinfoil kit car before 2032, since Musk reiterated a 250,000 unit annual production rate and it would take 8 years to build 2 million of them, if they can ever get the production line in Texas up to speed, as the only Tesla factory that is set up to produce these things. Of course, the 2 million number is very likely pure nonsense, and we already know that the adoption rate plummeted after the price on the vehicle jumped, so it's anybody's guess as to how many orders are actually in the queue, and there's no mention of sales volume of these things in the slide deck, as the delivered Cybertrucks were lumped into the other model's production number on page 8, with an annual number that was lower than that of 2022, showing 0% growth year over year. One of the Tesla stories that investors have bought into for years now was Musk's lure of a 50% Kager, or compound annual growth rate, the expectation that company sales would grow exponentially at a rate of 150% per year. This has been a Musk selling point for investors for a long time, and a promise he made them last year. This point came up during the Q3 call, when numbers were not as expected, and it came up on this call too. The question asked at the 29 minute mark. The next question is, does the company anticipate 50% volume Kager to be realized in either 2024 or 2025? If not, why not? As we've said in our prior guidance, there will be periods where we won't be growing at the same rate as before. We are between two major growth waves. The first one began with the global expansion of Model 3 and Y, and we believe the next one will be initiated with the next generation platform. In 2024, our volume growth will be you know, lower, as we have said, because we're trying to focus the team on the launch of the next generation vehicle. One of the talking points mentioned by several people and in the presenter deck is that the company is in between two major growth cycles right now, with the next expected cycle to be provided by the next generation vehicles, which have not been unveiled and do not have a production line established. There is also the question of guidance on existing models, and nobody on the panel had any information to share on this, with the printed materials saying that growth rate in 2024 will be notably lower than that of 2023. That should provide Tesla an opportunity to clear out the thousands of vehicles they currently have sitting in inventory, but won't do anything to help them get to their 50% Kager. Moving on to Dojo now, as we mentioned, the word Dojo does not appear in the investor slide deck at all, but mention of the Tesla Super Duper Wonder Computer is made at the 58 minute mark. Your release does not mention Dojo. So if you could just provide us an update on where Dojo stands and at what point you expect Dojo to be a resource in improving FSD, or do you think that you now have sufficient supply of NVIDIA uh, GPUs needed for the training of the system? I mean, the, the AI hardware question is, that, that is a deep one. We're obviously hedging our bets here with uh, significant orders of NVIDIA GPUs, and we're pursuing the dual path of NVIDIA and Dojo. I would you know, think of Dojo as a long shot. It's a long shot worth taking because the payoff is potentially very high, but it's not something that is uh, a high probability. It's, it's not like a sure thing at all. It's a higher risk, high payoff uh, program. 
The, the dojo is working and it is it is doing training jobs. And we have plans for dojo 1.5, dojo 2, dojo 3 and whatnot. It's got potential, but can't emphasize enough. High risk, high payoff. You know, even, even if it's a low low probability of success for the very high, yeah, I think anyway, <laughs> I'm belaboring the subject. In case you missed it, according to Musk, Dojo is a long shot with a low, low probability of success. It's a high risk, high reward scenario that Musk says is not a sure thing at all. This mega computer that's supposed to be training their FSD is a coin flip that might maybe hopefully someday get lucky and finally do what they want it to do. Then Musk goes on to say this high risk billion dollar investment has future high risk likely billion dollar investments to follow called Dojo 1.5, Dojo 2, and Dojo 3. Morgan Stanley seems to somehow think this computing technology is lining Tesla up for an asymmetrical share of a $10 trillion total addressable market. However, and this is important, absolutely nobody should be relying on Morgan Stanley for any sort of information or guidance where anything to do with Musk is concerned. Morgan Stanley is the financial institution that continually bends over backwards to do Musk's bidding, whether it's arranging financing for his purchase of Twitter or leveraging the Tesla stock that Musk has so he can raise cash to buy more Tesla stock options for pennies on the dollar. Given that Morgan Stanley led the financing efforts that Musk needed to complete his forced acquisition of Twitter by his own hand, and they have stood idly by and watched Musk burn that platform to the ground, to the point where it is now valued at less than the debt owing against it, with that debt now considered to be, quote, uninvestable. Morgan Stanley's judgment, where Musk is concerned, is impaired, to say the least. Now, what most people don't realize is that Dojo, when it was first announced, was supposed to be using a proprietary tech training towel that they named D1, which on paper blew everything else out of the water. That product was first unveiled in front of a crowd in 2016, Oh, sorry, that was the fake Solar City roof tile. Completely different bait and switch. Here's the Dojo D1 tile, unveiled at Tesla AI Day 2021, after being teased by Musk since 2019. It is worth noting, a year after the unveiling of that breakthrough technology, Tesla AI chief Andre Karpathy decided that would be a great time for him to look for another job. Also, last month, the head of Dojo development for nearly eight years, Ganesh Venkataramanan, decided Dojo wasn't the right fit for him either. That can only speak to the success that they've been having with this program. And it would appear the D1 seems to be a bit of a dud. What Tesla actually uses for Dojo is an array of 10,000 off-the-shelf NVIDIA H100 units, as was announced in August of 2023 by Tesla AI engineer Tim Zaman. And that 10,000 unit number sounds really impressive given the $30,000 price tag associated with the H100 until you realize that both Meta slash Facebook and Microsoft each bought 150,000 of these things in 2023 alone. On this graph, Tesla was the 12th largest buyer of this limited supply of processors, buying 5,000 fewer units than TikTok did last year. Hell, there's even a startup called Inflection AI, headed by the founder of DeepMind, and they've got an order in for 22,000 H100s. That's just for starters. Meta announced on January 19th of 2024 that it plans to buy over 350,000 of these units so that they can build out general intelligence and open source it responsibly. Zuckerberg is investing about $10 billion into this tech, while the New York governor just announced Tesla's $500 million dojo project is finally going to make use of some of the empty space at the largely vacant Gigafactory 2 in Buffalo. But Musk would have you believe that Tesla is the leader in AI supercomputer technology for the purpose of training their FSD software for universal release. One of the more confusing parts of the call is when Musk started talking about the AI inference capabilities of the car at around the 13 minute mark. There's also our inference hardware in the car. So we're what's called hardware four, but it's actually version two of the Tesla designed uh, AI inference chip. So as a side note, I, I think Tesla is probably the most efficient company in the world for AI inference. Out of necessity, we've, we've actually had to be extremely good at getting the most out of hardware because hardware three at this point is several years old. I think we're quite far ahead of any other company in the world in terms of AI inference efficiency. I mean, there's a potentially interesting play where when cars are not in use in the future, that the in-car computer can do generalized uh, AI tasks, can run a sort of GPT-4 or 3 or something like that, 
you know, if you've got tens of millions of vehicles out there, even in a robo taxi scenario where they're in heavy use, it, it like it's possible with the right architectural decisions that Tesla may in the future have more com compute than everyone else combined. Uh, we have a crazy amount of compute in our cars compared to anyone else. Yes. Yeah. It's like orders of magnitude. At some point in the future, we'd like to hear Musk's plan for using your personal vehicle as his computing asset to run AI tasks on behalf of the company that sold you the vehicle, because it sounds like that's what he is intending to do with your robo-taxis that are sitting idle. Which brings up another point. Is everybody still pretending that robo-taxis are going to be a thing? Didn't everybody learn their lesson losing money on their cars after Musk told buyers they were going to be an appreciating asset? Hertz certainly learned their lesson last year and decided to liquidate a portion of their EV fleet due to depreciation and service issues, including costs. Do you seriously think that Hertz would do an about face like that on their EV adoption program if they believed for one second that robo taxi upgrades were just around the corner? And on that note, let's take a listen to what Musk said about FSD version 12 at about the 12 minute mark during his opening statement. For full self-driving, we've released version 12, which is a complete uh, architectural rewrite compared to prior versions. This is end-to-end -end, uh, artificial intelligence. So another bit nets, basically photons in and controls out. It, it, it really is uh, quite a profound difference. Musk has this habit of saying every time a piece of software needs modifying that it required a total rewrite. He said the exact same thing on a Twitter space when discussing modifications he planned to make to the Twitter platform, not knowing that the person he was talking to was a former Twitter software engineer. And when Ian Brown called Musk out on his obvious understanding deficit regarding the platform, Musk resorted to name calling. Here's a part of that conversation. Frankly, if, for, if you want to have a really high velocity of features, I think the, 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 we'll just need to do a, a total rewrite of the, the whole thing. Wait, sir. Seriously, a, a total rewrite. That's your that's your prediction for velocity. Yeah. Well, when you say a total rewrite, do you mean starting with the skeleton or a bunch of engineers sit down with a whiteboard and say, what is Twitter? Uh, Revolution or reform? I, I mean, I just mean like literally like this, this, the, it, like you could either try to uh, amend this, the, the, the crazy stack that exists or uh, re rewrite it. When you say crazy stack, what do you mean? Like break it down. Have you seen have you seen George's like <laughs> diagram? No, no, no. I mean like what do you mean by are, are you, crazy? No, no, seriously. Uh, do, do you, do you, uh, Come on, buddy. Come on. Who who are you? What do you mean who am I? <laughs> I don't know. You gave me the mic. I got no. I didn't clue. give you the mic. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I I'm I'm doing the mic and let's let's keep it let's keep it civil in my space. Yeah. Like what no no man, you're in charge of the servers and the programming, whatever. Like what is right, the no, stack? No, no, no. We, we keep things on, technical man. in my space, please. Take take it take it take me from top to bottom. What does the stack look like right now? What's so crazy about it? What's so abnormal about this stack versus every other large scale system on the planet, buddy? Come on, give Wait, it to me. Amazing! Yeah. Wow, Wait. you're a jackass. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. All right, no, no, no. I got I got no credibility here, buddy. I got okay, no idea. Let's, let's, let's keep, first, let's, first let's, off, let's, first let's, off, let's, 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 let's keep my space simple. Here, you know? It's pretty obvious Musk was out of his depth here, and hilariously so. It's also pretty obvious that Musk is trying the same claim here with FSD, probably with a similar limited level of understanding on what FSD is or how it's built. Also, if you're taking the FSD beta version 11.420.69 beta program and completely rewriting the architecture from top to bottom, you wouldn't call it FSD 12. You would more properly call it FSD 2.0 version 1. And more importantly, the entire testing protocol for that software would have to start all the way back at square one. No results from previous iterations should have any bearing here. Do you remember about six months ago when Tesla stock was at their 52 week high? What was happening right around that time? Musk announced that Tesla was in talks with another automaker to license their full self-driving software and it drove the share price up to $293 per share. At the same time, FSD version 11.4.4 came out. So how is Tesla doing with that arrangement? Has there been any progress made with an FSD licensing agreement with another company? You know, I, I, I really think lots of car companies should be asking for FSD licenses, but we've had some tentative conversations, but I think they don't believe it's real quite yet. I think that that will become obvious probably this year. 
And I do want to emphasize that if I were CEO of another car company, I would definitely be calling Tesla and asking to license Tesla for self-driving technology. It's uh, definitely the smart move. Aside from this being what appears to be a very obvious pump of the stock, this begs the question, if every other auto manufacturer out there doesn't believe this feature is real, why did the people who paid twelve dollars to $15,000 for this feature? And the answer is they bought into the hype of another product that Musk cannot deliver. You'll remember we did a quick episode on the tweet that Musk put out on January 15th, suggesting that Musk was looking for a 25% voting share in the company before moving forward with AI and robotic development. That is despite the fact that Musk only has 13% of the company. Oddly enough, that tweet was in response from a particular Tesla bull, saying that Musk needed a better compensation package to keep him interested in Tesla. Now in this call, he's asked about that tweet. Here's the question and Musk's answer at the 25 minute mark. Should retail shareholders be concerned that Elon has stated that he's uncomfortable expanding AI and robotics at Tesla if he doesn't have 25% of voting? Yeah, I guess let me explain why. what, what my, my concern is here, which is that um, I see a path to creating an artificial intelligence and robotics juggernaut truly immense capability and power. And my concern would be, I don't want to control it, but if I have so little influence over the company at that stage that I could sort of be voted out by some sort of random shareholder advisory firm. You know, we've had a lot of challenges with institutional shareholder services, uh, ISS, I call them ISIS and Glass Lewis, which uh, there's a lot of activists that basically infiltrate those organizations and have strange ideas about what should be done. So I want, I want to have an, enough to be influential. I, like if we could do a dual, dual class stock, that would be ideal. I'm not looking for additional economics. I just want to be an effective steward of very powerful technology. The reason I just sort of roughly picked approximately 25% was that that's not so much that I can control the company, even if I go bonkers. And if I'm like mad, they, they can throw me out. But it's enough that I have a strong influence. That's what, that's what I'm aiming for is a strong influence, but not control. If there's some way to achieve that, that would be great. So it's confirmed. Musk now wants a dual tier share structure at Tesla so he can maintain a stronger influence over the company than his present share ownership allows for. And he's using the threat of a powerful AI juggernaut as the excuse for making what is essentially a demand, threatening to take the robotics and AI component away from Tesla to form a company that he can control. That is despite Musk making the following statements during this call. The AI technologies were developed for the car translate quite well to a humanoid robot because the car is just a robot on four wheels. You know, Tesla is arguably already the biggest robot maker in the world. It's just a four-wheeled robot. Um, our main goal with the, these AI day things is recruiting and to, ch to sort of change the perception of Tesla as people think of Tesla as a car company when they should be thinking of Tesla as an AI robotics company. In-car computer can do generalized uh, AI tasks, you know, GPT-4 or 3 or something like that. Even in a robo-taxi scenario, with in heavy use. With the right architectural decisions, Tesla may in the future have more compute than everyone else combined. So even now, Musk continues to call Tesla a robotics and AI company rather than an auto company, while threatening to take that same technology developed at Tesla elsewhere if he doesn't get his way. And in the meantime, Musk would appear to be going into direct competition with OpenAI as he reportedly attempts to raise $6 billion for his XAI startup. You'd almost think that that would be a direct conflict of interest, given the never-ending delay in reaching RoboTaxi and FSD milestones at Tesla. Musk has publicly denied trying to raise $6 billion for his XAI project, but Gordon Johnson of GLJ Research found and posted the SEC filings. The two boogeymen that Musk identifies in these statements are the independent shareholder organizations Glass Lewis and Institutional Shareholder Services, which Musk nicknamed ISIS, something he thought was clever. He claims that these organizations have been infiltrated by activists and those activists have some strange ideas. But since these organizations are not themselves shareholders, but are rather shareholder advisory organizations, Musk would be in no danger of these organizations voting on Tesla company matters in any way. Their function is to act as outside advisors for shareholders in a particular company and provide guidance. And these two advisory firms don't always agree. Case in point, the 2016 acquisition of SolarCity by Tesla. It was seen quite differently by these two firms. ISS wrote in favor of the deal, which helped Musk immensely in convincing shareholders of Tesla to carry out exactly what Glass Lewis saw this transaction to be. 
a thinly veiled bailout of Musk and his cousins at the expense of the Tesla shareholders. Given how after that acquisition went through, Solar City was stripped down to the bone, locked in a basement and left there to rot, it would appear that Glass Lewis hit the nail on the head for that one. But the disrespect that Musk shows these companies perfectly demonstrates the disdain Musk has for other shareholders in his publicly traded company. See, Musk loves the idea of everybody else giving him their money for his ventures, but then he doesn't appreciate whatsoever that their partial ownership in the company also gives them a say in how it's supposed to be run and who should be running it. To override these smaller investors, Musk wants Tesla to change their per share voting structure so that his tier of shares are the only ones allowed to vote to give him ultimate control over the company, which would be a total breach of the current Articles of Incorporation filed for this Delaware registered company. Such dual class share structures are established at the time of incorporation, which Tesla did not do. That is exactly the type of shareholder advocacy that organizations such as ISS and Gloss Lewis provide as independent advisors, which would be one of the true reasons why Musk is vilifying them here. Of course, it wouldn't be a Tesla earning call if someone didn't ask about Musk's pet vaporware project, Optimus. The question comes at the 32 minute mark and the answer meanders quite a bit, so we've cut it down to the good bits. What is the timeline for Optimus first production of a volume production line and what are the barriers to getting there? Optimus obviously is a, is a, a very new product, an extremely revolutionary product and something that I think has the potential to far exceed the value of everything else that Tesla combined. It's by far the most sophisticated humanoid robot that's being developed anywhere in the world. I think we've got a good chance of shipping some number of Optimus units next year. Now that's obviously a case where we want to make sure that uh, Optimus is, is safe, especially at scale, and that there's no, it, it should be impossible for any centralized control to upload malware <laughs> to a humanoid robot. Musk again brings out the famous last words, delivery next year, to which the legions of muskrats no doubt lost their minds, but let's be honest here. Compared to other robots being designed by actual robot companies, Optimus is less than optimal. We'll go through why shortly, but for right now we wanted to point out that the concerns Musk is stating about the safety of these units includes the inability of a central server to upload malware, which would seem to preclude the ability for over-the-air updates and learning abilities for these units. It seems a little contradictory given previous statements made regarding the training ability of Dojo, but really, at this point, all of this seems like a plotline for iRobot 2. My logic is undeniable. Yes, Vicky. Undeniable. The conversation continues regarding safeties and the barriers to getting Optimus to production, where some hard truths are accidentally spoken aloud. We're going to want to build in um, localized shuttle that cannot be updated from, from a central server. That's a case where we really have to give extreme thought to safety. I, I do think it has the potential to be the most valuable, most valuable product of any kind ever. By far. Just to comment on the barrier, I think the barrier, and we've talked about this, is like getting it to actually do something useful. Like we can get it to walk around, we can get it to do things, but it's like that utility part. We can already do some useful things. But like, you know, yeah. to making millions of these things, it's like utility. Got to get the utility up. I mean, the, the Optimus Lab uh, looks like the set of Westworld. <laughs> but admittedly, that was not a super utopian situation. Yeah, not the best reference. So even the people in that room can't agree on the ability of Optimus to perform useful tasks, even though that is mentioned as a major barrier to getting the bot to market. And the Westworld reference went over like a lead balloon. Just you and me now, my friend. Adam Jonas from Morgan Stanley had a question now about getting an AI update. And the response from Musk was laughable. Your last AI day, Elon, was September 2022. Can we expect a Tesla AI day this year? It seems seems like a lot's changed in that in that realm. And is this year the time? <laughs> we, we have found that when we do these AI days, some of our competitors literally look at what we do on a frame by frame basis. And then we find these things being copied. Same thing with battery day. Same thing with battery day. Yeah. Um, so we have to be a little cautious about uh, revealing the exact recipe of the secret sauce. I think some kind of update would be good to do. Musk seems to be under the impression that his competitors watch the Optimus presentations and break it down frame by frame to copy his robotics project. First, pretty sure we haven't seen anybody copy Musk's robot homework, ever. It's probably a clue when robotics experts are calling Optimus 
a complete and utter scam that is next level cringeworthy. Call it a hunch. And second, the reason why people are breaking it down frame by frame is so we can figure out how Musk faked it. Most recently, the Tesla mannequin was seen folding a t-shirt on a table in a Twitter clip, and the frame by frame breakdown discovered how the animatronic performed that task. A human wearing haptic gloves that was cropped out of the right hand side of the frame was guiding every motion that the robot performed. Initially, Musk pretended on Twitter that Optimus was performing this task all on its own. Then, shortly afterwards, had to issue a disclaimer saying the bot could not in fact perform this task autonomously yet, but hopefully could do it autonomously at some point in the future. Every other taped demonstration of Optimus has been solidly debunked, and Thunderfoot, amongst others, did a remarkable job breaking the videos down. The only live demonstration, the first unveiling of Optimus, was nothing short of unremarkable. Right around the one hour mark, Musk went into a bit of a mental tailspin with this rant. For this bit, we have not cut out the pauses and stammering so he can get the full effect of his final contribution to the broadcast. And it's on the topic of cutting costs. So it's like, on average, if we reduce the cost by one penny, a billion dollars. What? <laughs> uh, you know, and we started off, you know, wasn't that long ago that we we're only making like 10 cars a week. Um, and, um, yeah. <laughs> so, where does it lead ultimately? You know, with good execution, like I said, it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's not a slam dunk, but with, you know, if we execute very well, I think Tesla could be the most valuable company in the world. And 60 seconds after this, Martin cut the call short. I think that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for all of your questions, and uh, we'll speak to you again in three months. The response from the press and analysts alike to this earnings call was overall negative to say the least. Dan Ives flat out stated the entire call was a train wreck, a masterclass in how not to do an earnings call. Investors appear to agree with that assessment. The stock price took a hit in after hours when investors were finally able to review the documents. It dropped further during the call as the participants, in Ives' paraphrased words, acted like a bunch of children while he was expecting to hear from adults who were running a multi-billion multinational corporation. And before the market opened on the following day, stock had dropped even further by over $25 per share, representing an evaporation of almost $80 billion in market cap. That drop removed Tesla from the top 10 valued publicly traded companies. Friday's trading did nothing to reverse that situation, closing the day relatively flat. And really, the stock price might not reverse. There's no reason for it to. This call quite decidedly told the world there is nothing exceptional happening at Tesla on any front. The margin story is dead. The growth story is dead. Their existing product line is stale and the growth wave is over. The company will now have to rely on a new wave of low cost and therefore low margin next gen vehicles, which might get the ball rolling again. But their Mexico factory is on hold and their 4680 tech still needs to be sorted out. Dojo is a high risk but off the shelf tech and even its size will be put to shame by everyone from TikTok to Facebook. And Optimus remains an overhyped, barely functioning animatronic, nowhere near ready to send to market as a personal butler or fanboy sex bot. Has anyone ever told you that you're awfully cute for a meat body? Thanks for tuning in for this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic as we get back to producing part three of the Musk vs. Bezos HLS series, A Modern Space Race. Release date for that episode has been pushed back to next weekend due to getting this episode out for you in short order. So please share this episode with your friends, make sure you're subscribed, and ring that notification bell so that you'll know when The Common Sense Skeptic returns.